uh, first of course we'll begin with our Mangala Charna before we get into the actual verses. Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desutarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpaturubhyascha Kripa Sindubhyayevacha Patitanam Pavanipyo Vaishnavipyo Namo Namaha Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya so today, for our exploration, we get to look at two texts from Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Canto 1, Chapter 10. First is Text 15. Mridanga Shanka Beryascha Vina Panava Gomuka Dunduryanaka Gantadya Nedor Dundu Bhayastata while the Lord was departing from the palace of Hastinapur, different types of drums like the Muranga, Dhol, Nagra, Dunduri, and Dunduvi, and flutes of different types, the Veena, Gomuka, and Bedi, all sounded together to show him honor. And then we have text 16. Prasada Shikara Rudha Guru Naryo Didrikshaya Vavrishu Kushume Krishna Prema Vrida Smitekshana Out of a loving desire to see the Lord, the royal ladies of the Kurus got up on top of the palace and smiling with affection and shyness, they showered flowers upon the Lord. Purport by His Divine Grace Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Shyness is a particular extra natural beauty of the fair sex, and it commands respect from the opposite sex. This custom was observed even during the days of the Mahabharat, i.e., more than 5,000 years ago. It is only the less intelligent persons, not well versed in the history of the world, who say that the observance of separation of male from female from male, is an introduction of the Mohammedan or Muslim period in India. This incident from the Mahabharat period proves definitely that the ladies of the palace observed strict parda, restricted association with men. And instead of coming down in the open air where Lord Krishna and others were assembled, the ladies of the palace went up on, on the top of the palace and from there paid their respects to Lord Krishna by showers of flowers. It is definitely stated here that the ladies were smiling there on the top of the palace checked by shyness. This shyness is a gift of nature to the fair sex and it enhances their beauty and prestige even if they are of a less important family or even if they are less attractive. We have practical experience of this fact. A sweeper woman commanded the respect of many respectable gentlemen simply by manifesting a lady's shyness. Half naked ladies in the street do not command any respect but a shy sweeper's wife commands respect from all. Human civilization, as conceived of by the sages of India, is to help one free himself from the clutches of illusion. The material beauty of a woman is an illusion, because actually the body is made of earth, water, fire, air, etc. But because there is the association of the living spark with matter, it appears to be beautiful. 
No one is attracted by an earthen doll, even if it is most perfectly prepared to attract the attention of others. The dead body has no beauty because no one will accept the dead body of a so-called beautiful woman. Therefore, the conclusion is that the spirit spark is beautiful. And because of the soul's beauty, one is attracted by the beauty of the outward body. The Vedic wisdom therefore forbids us to be attracted by false beauty. But because we are now in the darkness of ignorance, the Vedic civilization allows very restricted mixing of women and men. They say that the woman is considered to be the fire and the man is considered to be the butter. The butter must melt in the association with fire and therefore they may be brought together only when it is necessary. And shyness is a check to, un to the unrestricted mixing. It is nature's gift and it must be utilized. <laughs> I know these, this is like one of the, interestingly enough, like the heavier purports I find. Um, and, you know, quite interesting that one of these heavier purports is right in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we find ourselves right in the first canto. You know, we haven't even gotten so far, but um, we find that Srila Prabhupada is giving us lessons in society, lessons in civilization, lessons in uh, propriety, lessons in chivalry, how to live with integrity. And um, for a modern thinking person, this can kind of like rub us the wrong way. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, what do we think we're doing? You know, is this all about control? Is this all about controlling one group of people over another group of people? Um, and what I kind of like and what I've, after, you know, looking at these two texts and looking at this chapter, what I kind of like is that there's this principle of everything in Krishna's service. So one might think, you know, how, how does one use shyness in Krishna's service? Well, there's, this is how. But also we see when Krishna returns to Dwarka and when he's uh, received by all of the citizens of Dwarka, we find that even his wives, they exhibit this, this kind of shyness. Um, you know, which can kind of lead us to, to feel like, but what if, what if I'm not a shy person? What if I'm an outspoken person? What if I'm a person that is ready to do anything and everything for what I believe in? Does that make me less of a feminine nature? Does that mean I have less of a feminine nature? What, what does this mean? And um, one thing that we'll touch upon as we, as we go forward was that when we come to the platform of devotional service, right, when we really get into bhakti, devotion, loving this supreme person um a lot of those distinctions tend to like go out the window and as Srila Prabhupada says we start relating to one another on the basis of that beautiful spiritual spark of the soul so we can we can kind of see that we have an interesting commentary on shyness on people and on the different categories of people and how they have their specific places within society, how they were honored within society, and even 5,000 years ago, um, how we can value a society that puts some restrictions on free mixing between men and women. Uh, now, like, why? A lot of people, they tend to feel like, why? Why, why put these restrictions on? Why, why do we have to have them? Um, but maybe what if we look at it as not a society determined to oppress women but a society determined to protect them at all costs um understanding that from the beginning of time there have been people who have decided that they want to force their will upon someone that they view as weaker that they want to force their power and oppress those who they feel are more inferior. Is that true? Are they actually inferior? 
No. But from time immemorial, if we look at Srimad Bhagavatam, we have 5,000 years ago. If we look at Mahabharat, this, this 5,000 years, and still, there are so many cases, Draupadi herself, where she was mistreated in an assembly of males. And somehow or other, no one said anything. And she had to, to make one of the biggest examples of surrender ever seen. We have the, the example of Sita Devi. Sita was left alone for what? It, it felt like 15 minutes. They left her for 15 minutes. And somebody comes and kidnaps her. They would like to force their, their idea of what they want onto the, the goddess of the entire world, the entire universe. We have even, you know, Ravan, there are so many different stories. Um, and he worships Lord Shiva and then turns his attention after worshiping Lord Shiva and getting a boon, he turns his attention on to Parvati Devi. And this doesn't just happen once, it happens several times. There's so many demons who think, you know, I cannot destroy Lord Shiva. But I'm going to figure out a way to get Parvati. Like, what is the deal? So, you know, we have a Vedic civilization, which is looking at this separation between men and women for the protection of everyone. Because when left to our own devices, human beings, embodied souls, somehow or other, get this idea in our minds that we have to have power and control over others. And it comes to a point where we will do anything and everything to have that control and that power over others. Whether it means hurting them, inflicting trauma on others, telling them the worst things. So um, this, this protection is not just for the women, but also for the men. Because if it so happens that they start to misuse that little minute bit of power that we wind up having, then we start to oppress and suppress others and, and, and have this greed to lord it over others, to control others, to exert our tiny little bit of power over others. We see what happens. There is an entire fratricidal war, which millions of people, I know we spoke about this last time, millions, hundreds of millions of people died in this war. And one of the very defining factors of why they died in this war was because of the mistreatment of Draupadi, the mistreatment of this woman. So in disrespecting uh, one of the women of society, the, one of the penalties was easily death. So if we think about it that way, yeah, everybody needs protecting. Everybody needs this situation where it's okay, maybe we should put some distance, so a respectful distance between the two. And, um, and I think that that's sometimes what we can miss when we just read through these purports and read through these verses, uh, is that the, the distance was not out of a demeaning quality, saying you're less than, so you go sit over there. Um, the distance was with the utmost respect. Right when you when you would visit someone, there are codes of conduct, there are rules of conduct to be observed when you visit someone, and sometimes uh, even to request seeing the queen of another king could be seen as a grave insult. Because how dare you? Um, and so I kind of. And I, I'm sure I know I've like romanticized it more in my mind. But um, with this ideal of Vedic civilization, I've kind of looked at it as charming and chivalrous and heroic. Uh, something where you, you feel proud 
of all of the qualities that you have. So this shyness that Srila Prabhupada speaks about, it wasn't something meant to keep people silent. It was something that you could be proud of, something that was even cultivated. Right? They would teach how to, how to be shy and demure and elegant and graceful, all of these things. But also, um, it doesn't mean that they didn't also teach women how to fight. So they would also teach them how to fight, how to ride horses, how to be warriors, uh, Kaikei was such a famous example of a warrior queen of Dasarath. She saves him on a battlefield. Uh, Krishna takes Satyabhama with him to go kill demons. So we see these examples of these warrior queens. So it's not unheard of. Uh, and it's not as though your days are to be sent, spent just kind of like sitting in the other room, completely uh, detached from everything else that was going on. These princesses, these queens, these ladies were taught political intrigue. Uh, they were taught the way that political alliances are formed. They were not at all ignorant of their place in society or what could happen or how their seniors or their fathers or even they themselves were making political alliances. Um, and so I really like Vedic civilization because it's very well-rounded. There's a, there's a place for everyone. If you are outspoken, there's a place for it. But if you are not outspoken, there's also a place for it. And there's a place to honor all of those characteristics. So it always gives me a little like spark of joy when I see even the most like confusing purports. Um, and so, you know, Mishila Prabhupada says, half-naked ladies in the, in the street do not command respect from anyone. Now, one might think that Srila Prabhupada is coming from this Bengali background, Calcutta in the 1800s, early 1900s, then coming to America. So, you know, Calcutta in that time, this is India where people won't even really hold hands in public. Uh, people, they are not engaging in any public displays of affection. And then imagine you come to America, not just America, but you come to New York in the 1960s. And New York is really free. Um, I, I've always been free, always going to be really, really free. Uh, on one side, it's incredibly accepting. You can be literally anything and no one cares. They're not going to look at you weird. They're going to let you do what you do. If you go out on Harinam, they'll probably join you because they're so free and so open. But imagine being an elderly gentleman who, I mean, you know, he had several children. So it's not like he was ignorant of things. But then to come into the 1960s in, in America and in New York and see people in all kinds of dress, right? It was like one extreme to the other. So everybody had felt so closeted and, and suffocated by all of these rules and regulations and all of the above. And that now they have this liberation movement. So the pendulum swings all the way far to the other side. So it's like, you know, we were, all of everything was constricting about society. The clothes, politics, society, everything was constricting. So now we are not going to constrict anything. Right? We go to the other side. Don't wear anything if you don't want to. Don't wear clothes. Join a commune. Live on a farm. Even if you wear clothes, don't wear a bra. Like, you know, so like you've got all of these things and now you've got this elderly gentleman coming into this environment. And it, it's not, you know, uh, I can only imagine that he has to Krishnaize everything. Because if, if we look at India and if we look at so many of the temples, if we look at even ladies in villages. Um, so many of them, like if we, if we look at carvings and temples, 
none of those women have all the clothes on. You see so many forms of, of the human body. And then if you go into villages, you'll find a very interesting thing, uh, which is that, especially in Bengal, up until a certain point, blouses were not a thing. So, like, you know, like a, you know, now we have a choli, we have a sari blouse. That wasn't really a thing for a long time. Uh, and so, even now, today, you'll see women, and then sometimes you, 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 you're looking at a modiji for a long time, and then you realize... Oh well, she's not. She's not wearing a blouse at all. Okay, um, and and usually it's the it's the older ones. So n usually nobody's looking at them anyway because they're the older ones. It's like never the ones that you want to see. <laughs> it's always the ones that you're like, what? How did this happen? Why is this happening? But um, but looking at the way society works, it was new, but also not new. Right? It was just free in a different way. But also looking at a place that has the, the sari, which drapes long, covers the legs. And then now you come to a place where it's like, the, the shorter the shorts, the better. Um, I can only imagine as he's writing these purports and, and looking at all of the different things that are occurring, uh yeah you can you can have a nostalgia to bring back this vedic civilization the purport of vedic civilization where it's like you know sometimes less is more but not with clothing like where more clothing show less is more like there's a there's an art to this this idea of of being coy there's an, there's an art to this idea of being demure. There's an art to this idea of... I'll give an example. My, my spiritual master, I feel like he does this on purpose. He can be extremely soft-spoken. And when he's giving a lecture in front of loads of people on a microphone, it can be really nice and loud. But when he talks to you one-on-one, -on -one, I feel like sometimes he talks like softer softer and softer as the conversation goes on and there's a room full of people milling around and speaking and I kind of started to feel like he did this so that you'd pay attention more like I, I feel like he's now doing it on purpose like he's going to speak softer and softer so you have to come closer and closer and you really have to pay attention to what he said like you have to really want to know and be in this conversation completely invested that's what I feel like is the same thing with this characteristic of shyness there is an idea, you know, there's like this, this idea of like, when you're not revealing everything, that mysteriousness kind of draws other people in more and more and more. Um, and so I, I feel as though women were able to cultivate this, this characteristic in the ideal form 5,000 years ago and before and even today. And I think that there was a, there was a lot to be said for where and how women would rule. So now we're like, what? Ruling? Yes. Um, but usually it was like behind closed doors. They would find ways to manipulate situations, turn situations over to their favor, and it's not like they would never speak to the men that were in their company. Draupadi spoke a lot to everybody. She expressed when she was upset. She made it known when she was happy. A lot of times she expressed it when she was upset. Uh, there were so many times within Mahabharat after the great gambling match when she tells you to steer, she gives him a piece of her mind quite often. They are in that, that forest for 12 long years and he has to hear about it a lot. We wouldn't be in this situation if it weren't for the gambling. You could have stopped at any time, but you didn't. And and she takes a vow. She's like, you know, I won't I won't decorate my hair and braid my hair. I'm gonna leave it out. I'm not gonna brush it. It's gonna get matted. It's get but it serves as a constant reminder. And she never lets those around her forget. 
Look at my pitiable condition. Look at, I'm the empress of the entire world and somehow I have no, no facilities. I've got no possessions. And we all know whose fault that is. Sometimes she would speak with Bhima. You know, were it not for your gambling brother, <laughs> we'd be somewhere having a wonderful feast and Bhima's always on her side then. Um, so, you know, women would rule in a different way. And because this is everything in Krishna's service, you know, is it always about being shy? No. Uh, we, we have the example of Rukmini, who at a young age, Shastra says she's maybe 14 to 16, somewhere in that age range. She sets her sights on Krishna and decides she's going to take matters into her own hands. And she writes a letter. And even in that letter, she says, I fixed my shameless mind upon you. She even says, yes, I'm being, I'm being incredibly bold. But I've learned the ways of political intrigue. And if there's a dire situation, then all of those distinctions go out the window. I know that I want nobody but Krishna to be my Lord for my life. And so I'll do whatever is necessary even if that means acting in a way that would make somehow society look at me sideways and say, oh, it's very interesting. Like, that's not normally how a young lady should act. I don't care. And she was willing to risk everything. She tells Krishna in the letter, you know, you, you should come kidnap me. And if you're worried about my family members getting hurt, watch, I'll go to the temple of the goddess Gauri there will be no family members there. You don't have to fight with anybody. You drive up, I'll get on the chariot, everything will be fine. And then she tells him, she says, you know, I'll, I'll wait for you. And if you don't come, that's fine. I understand that maybe I'm not worthy of you. But if you don't come, please know that I'll probably just give up my entire life right that moment. And I'll do penance until I get another birth where I'll be worthy of you. Like, no pressure. Right? No pressure at all. If you don't show up, I'll just die. It's fine. And she says, you know, others may look at me and ask me why I'm so bold. Even you yourself, you might question why I'm being so bold. Well, it's your own fault. No one told you to be so heroic and charming and chivalrous. Like, you did all of these things. You have all of these opulences. And then you expect me to be shy and stay in the back and not voice when I have an issue. Well, I, I can't. What intelligent woman would not do the same thing in my own shoes? So she becomes bold in her service. Right? Her service, she's like, I'm meant to be with Krishna. That is my purpose in life. So she abandons all of that shyness when it comes to her devotional service. And then she takes liberty and tells Krishna that it's his own fault. We also have the case, not only of just Draupadi, not only of just Rukmini. We have Satyabhama, who is always fiery. She's always willing to tell Krishna what's on her mind. Uh, and this is another of Krishna's wives. She often tells him, you know, I don't, I don't think you did the right thing. I don't think you were in the right there. Even there are some times when he speaks about Vrindavan. They hear about pastimes in Vrindavan. And she thinks, well, honestly, I don't think he should go anywhere. I don't really see why he would have to go back. What's so great about those gopis? I mean, we also have love for Krishna. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have love for Krishna. And then Krishna has to rein her, her wonderful, uh, fiery nature back in. And usually he does so by calling her the daughter of Satrajit. So, oh, daughter of Satrajit, reminding her of the big issue of why they got married, the big debacle that caused their marriage. So just reminding her, oh, remember, you know, remember that time when your father was supposed to give me a jewel and then he didn't, and then he accused me of murder. 
when I didn't do anything. And then I had to go to a forest. And then I had to go fight a human celestial bear person. And then I had to go get the jewel back. And then I had to come all the way back. And then everybody thought I died, but I didn't die. And then I came back and then, and then we got married. And, you know, it's just that one, that one title. Oh, daughter of Satrajit. And then she kind of brings it back in. But why is she so fiery? It's only because Krishna likes it. Everything in Krishna's service. Krishna enjoys different varieties of relationships. He's hungry for it. So he's hungry for us to show him how invested we are. He's hungry. And he'll keep poking at us. Right? We, we think sometimes... Okay, here we go. I'm going to surrender. And I'm going to I'm going to read all the books. I am going to formulate my life the way all of the books say I should. I'm going to check all the boxes. I'm going to do all the things and then surrender will happen. No problem. And you know, we start this surrender and we start this process of chanting. And first we feel great. We feel awesome. There's sometimes it's like a buzzing feeling. It's like, I feel so much lighter. I had all this anxiety and now my mind is clearer. Everything is good. And then we keep chanting. And, and that's kind of where the problem comes in. We, we keep chanting and then all of a sudden we get all the stuff we don't like to look at. We get to see the greed in ourselves. We get to see the lust in ourselves. We get to see the anger in ourselves. We get to see all the things. None of them are things that we ever want to look at. But the holy name, it's like it picks up this huge mirror and shines it directly on us. Okay, now what? What do we do? The trick is to try and keep chanting through it. Uh, Buri John Prabhu was giving a Japa seminar and he was saying that if we stick with it and we're able to chant through the desert of the mind, we'll be able to find the oasis of Krishna's association. Which for me, I was like, oh, so good. Because that's exactly what it feels like. You get to this part and it's all desert and parched and dry air and it's hot. And it's annoying and nobody wants to look at those things. Am I really like that? And, you know, the holy name, super soul within the heart, says, maybe, yeah. You know, whose side are you on? Ours. But, you know, our, 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 our greatest side. And if we're able to chant through that, we get to the oasis of, of Krishna's association. And unlike an oasis that you might find in the desert, it's not a mirage, right? The desert part, that's, that's the mirage. The real, the real vision is that we were never far away from Krishna to begin with. We just kind of thought that we were, right? We, we believed in the wrong thing. So when we, when we start chanting, and then we get to that part. I feel as though Krishna, he, he begins poking us. Like, yeah, okay. Your, your Krishna consciousness is looking a lot like somebody else's. No problem. But I want yours. I want, I want to see what your Krishna consciousness is like. What's your heart like? And all of these people who abandon uh, their shyness in the performance of their devotional service, they also find this Krishna who likes to poke at them, press, push their buttons. Krishna is an expert at finding exactly what is going to trigger you, exactly what is going to annoy you, exactly what is going to drive you just a little crazy, and he's going to poke. He's going to push that button. Okay, how do we deal with it? What are they going to do now? How are they going to respond? Can they call out to me in any situation? Will they call out to me in any situation? And so we have to 
remember that this is actually a characteristic of Krishna's sweetness. He only really does this with the people he likes a lot. His wives, his friends, his parents, all of those family members that he holds near and dear, he troubles them a lot. He's gonna push their buttons. So if we find ourselves in a situation where we are trying to say, okay, everything in Krishna's service, and then we find ourselves being like, there's like this constant poking. It's like, why? It means Krishna likes us. It means he's trying to get to the heart of what our devotional service is. What is it that you're really doing? Yeah, 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 sure. Your devotional service can look like somebody else's. No problem. You read it in a book and you think A plus B equals C. But, but what if it doesn't? Where's your fiery nature? What does, what does that look like when you get pushed to the point beyond the formal, right? Beyond that point where you're, where you're looking at God the Father and it's so much reverence and all of the things that you think, I'd never say that to God. That's ridiculous. You know, God is meant to be respected until God presses your buttons. And as God presses your buttons, then you start to have those conversations and those prayers that you never thought you would have. The prayers that go a little bit like, why are you like this? Why can't you just leave me alone respectfully? Also respectfully, why do you feel the need to create issues in my life? Also respectfully, if you don't stop creating issues in my life, you and I are going to have many arguments but this is what Krishna wants. He wants to bring us to the place where now we feel so connected to the Supreme Person that we're going to argue with that Supreme Person. We are going to have these ongoing conversations with the Supreme Person. Why? Because he's ours. And we're his. Not only are we out, he's ours and we're his, but when it comes to family, those are the conversations you have. Everybody gets down and dirty. Like we, all the formality goes out the window. And, you know, that's what I think is the difference between this characteristic of shyness. There's a little bit of awe and reverence. There's the formality, right? And we can, we can feel a little bit shy at the beginning. I don't know. I, I don't want to ask Krishna for that. I don't want to pray for that. You know, there's, it's, there's a, we hold back until we get in those situations where we're really in close. And then there's no holding back. I'm gonna pray about everything. No, no holds barred. He's gonna know everything. He said he was seated in everybody's heart. He said he already knew. He was seated as the witness. And so sometimes I find myself asking him, you are the witness within the heart. Why are you just simply witnessing this? Can't you change this? Whatever situation that's happening here, don't we want to be active and not just witnesses anymore? You know, just jump in anytime, you know, tag team. You're it, your turn. Uh, but this, this for me is when that shyness gets thrown out the window. Srila Prabhupada even encouraged his disciples to come to that point where nothing stops us in our devotional service he would engage his female disciples just the same way he would engage his male disciples. He encouraged them to be just as fierce as their counterparts. And what he encouraged was this knowledge that, you know what, when it comes to Krishna's service, I, am, I don't have to be any of those things. Right? This is our famous, famous verse. I am not a brahmachari. Grihasta, Vanapras, Sanyasi, right? I'm not any of those things. I am not a Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, none of those things. We are simply the servants of the servants of those beautiful, simple cowherd women who had Krishna's heart wholly and solely. So he encouraged everyone to come to that platform of all of those societal limitations, all of those limitations, even medically, 
none of those limitations matter. Whatever limitations you see of gender, race, caste, creed, religion, whatever it is, none of those matter. When it comes to abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me, he literally means surrender everything. Everything you think you are. Even if that means, like, you know, we start to think, I am, you know, I tend to be the best at certain things. Krishna will poke at you until you start to abandon that too. It is usually um, when I'm leading a kirtan and I think to myself, wow, I'm doing a great job. That's usually when everything falls apart. And I lose contact, eye contact with the murdanga player. The mics go out. I can't see the kartals, but I hear them. Somebody else starts playing off. Somebody else brings in a tambourine from I don't know where. <laughs> Everything goes haywire. And then I have to remind myself, right, this was about surrender. I have to surrender all the things that I think I am. And remember who's really driving this chariot. It's always Krishna. He's in the driver's seat. And, and not only is Krishna in the driver's seat, but he's so, he does it so lovingly. He, he's going to get on your nerves, but also he's going to love you like nobody else. And, I, you know, I can say this because they told me to have a really personal relationship with Krishna ever since I was young. And if I'm going to have the most personal relationship with my best friend, then I'm going to have to be truthful and tell you people that sometimes he's going to get on your nerves. Some, some days, you might not like him that much. But it's always worth it. Because even when he gets on our nerves, he's going to do it so lovingly. Somehow or other, he's going to sneak in there with more love than we ever thought possible. Somehow or other, just when we think, you know what? I'm going to abandon all varieties of everything, including you. He either doesn't let us forget him. Or he swoops in and saves the day in such a way that you think, wow, I couldn't have even fathomed that this would happen. And I, I spoke to somebody recently and they were lamenting the loss of their service. They were saying, I used to be a pujari. I used to be a priest on the altar serving the deities personally. And now all that is gone. I said, yeah. I feel your pain. This, this, this pandemic and everything around it has really it hit people hard. I said, but I bet you, I bet you through all of that, Krishna made another service for you. And they said, you're right. I started teaching and, and counseling yoga students where now I'm doing several workshops where now like there are 40, 50 people who are coming to me and asking me for advice and doing all of these things. So there you go. Uh, sometimes, and it's been, it's been a meditation that I've been going over and over in my mind the past week. Sometimes we have to let Krishna finish his statement. We have an idea in our minds of what we want, how the blessing is supposed to happen, how the miracle is supposed to occur. All of these things, I've mapped it all out. Organizational skills on point, got it. And then Krishna goes, yeah, well, what about plan C? I'm like, I didn't have a plan C. We had plan A and we had the backup plan B. That was it. He's like, yeah, but plan C, let's try it. I'm like, what is plan C? He's like, first, we take your plan and annihilate the whole thing. And you think, why would you do this? What is your problem? Why can't we just do things my way? But we have to let... Krishna finishes statement. All those times when we think we hear no, what if it's, okay, wait, not yet. What if it's not quite, but we're so stuck on the no that we're like, oh, you know what? I can't believe this. And then we throw temper tantrums and then we, I can't surrender anymore to this guy because he doesn't have my best interests at heart. And then, and then in time, his plan comes. And we think, I could have never planned this this way. Well, of course not. Because Krishna is also the, nobody is going to plan like Krishna. He's the best 
at whatever he does. So no one is going to make a miracle quite like Krishna. He's also, nobody else is going to get on your nerves like Krishna. But I guarantee you, he will swoop in and save the day. Every single time. If we let him. If we let him. So, you know, when we, when we look at Vedic civilization, um, this idea of shyness, this idea of commanding respect with integrity and character, and even this idea of abandoning all of it, uh, I feel as though Krishna sets up these situations to free us from those designations and those limitations. Those times where we think, oh, I can't, I, I can't pray, or I can't serve, or I can't chant, or I can't read, I don't, I don't have enough time, or I'm not a reader, or I'm not this, or I'm not that, none of those limitations matter. Where there's a will, there is absolutely a way. And Krishna has unlimited ways. And when we feel as though we're lacking that willpower, he's also given us the remedy. It's like, you, you just call on me. That Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 22, is one of my mom's favorite verses. To those who worship me, with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form. To them, I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. What a beautiful promise. Right? We shouldn't, when we read these things, we don't have to take them as a maybe. Right? He doesn't say, okay, maybe I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. Point blank, there's a period. I carry what they lack, I preserve what they have. So I take that as a promise. And when the divine supreme person makes a promise, I also take the liberty of reminding him of said promise. So there are many times when I'll look around and I say, okay, I've been meditating on you in your transcendental form. I'm ready, carry me, because I'm lacking. Where's the carrying? You said, so now you gotta live up to it. And this idea and this kind of theory of, of surrendering before we are forced to surrender, um, it works, but also you can't cheat a cheater. What we have to know about Krishna is that he cheats mercilessly. He's horrible with it. So just when we think, okay, this whole bhakti thing is about surrender. I'm going to surrender preemptively. Because we always hear, you know, Krishna's going to take everything away. I'm going to surrender preemptively. No problem. Uh, then, then Krishna starts to poke at you. But is it real? How much more real can the surrender get? Hey, are you still surrendering? Hey, how about we surrender now? Hey, how about we surrender in this situation? How about, how about when you've been given this prestigious position and you're going to speak in front of loads of people and then you're not? How about when you think you were supposed to get a raise or promotion from this job and instead they decide to keep you at the same spot that you've been at and put more restrictions on you? Are we still surrendering? Like, are we still looking like saying, okay, God has a plan in all areas of my life, or are we now, is it different? So that, you know, that sincerity, he's going to he's gonna find it with a magnifying glass. He's going to, like, scope out the territory. And why? Why does he put us through all of this? <laughs> why is he constantly asking us, reassessing if our surrender is true? If our char character and integrity are really linked to our devotion, if we are really practicing what we're preaching, why? Uh, because he knows that with this process of bhakti yoga, if we get it right, no, I won't say if, when we get it right, because I'm rooting for all of us, we're going to get it right. When we get it right, 
Krishna knows that that's it for him. He sold, purchased completely. Nothing else for him to do. He is going to be like the servant of that person who, who perfects this process. The example is the Pandavas themselves. And it says earlier in this chapter that just to give joy to the Pandavas and his own sister, he stays for a few months more. Not a few days, a few months more in Hastinapur. He's completely at the, the will and the whims of his, of his devotees. And he says, you know, I, I, I can't be conquered by all of the scriptural learning. You could read all the books. I don't care. You could think that you've spoken all the things. I don't care. He's like, but even if you haven't read all the books, even if you haven't done all of the, the, the right things, if there is that undeniable, undying love in the heart, he says there, I'm gladly, gladly conquered. He says about Draupadi, he says, Draupadi called out to me in distress, and I am forever indebted to her. Even just thinking about it makes me more indebted to her. And the more I think about it, the more indebted I am. I'm so grateful that she turned to me in times of distress. This is our friend. Sometimes difficult to understand, but this is why he's going to poke so much. This is why he's going to keep asking, is it real? Is it sincere? Is it, is it, is it? It's not because we're not doing enough, but it's because we're getting closer. So if we find ourselves in these situations and we find like, okay, I feel like I just did all that surrender work last month and here we are again. Don't think that you're getting farther from Krishna. He tests because we're getting closer. He pokes because we're getting closer. The closer we are, the more he has to look out for his own heart. And not only will he look out for his heart, but material nature is going to look out for his heart as well. Because material nature, she's a hard judge. She's seen it all. She's seen all the times that we promise, oh yes, I'm in distress and Lord, I'll love you forever. Just save me this one time and everything will be okay. And then she sees how we become that toxic person in the relationship and then after we get what we want, we kind of forget all the promises that we made five minutes ago when we were in distress. She has seen it. And as the sister of the Supreme Person, she is going to protect her brother with everything she's got. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand it until you I started watching my friends in, in different relationships and um, there was a friend I had and I felt very like territorial over them and they went through a bad breakup and so you know I thought I was like wow you know I don't want anybody to mistreat them again after that breakup they decided that they were going to do what everybody does when they go through a breakup which is I'm turning to God Right? It's like, that's the only relationship that matters now. When the heart's broken somehow, all of those verses, they hit so much deeper. It feels differently. Everybody, they go on a post, they go on a, like a post binge about like godly things, right? They dive into their spirituality. So my friend did this and I kind of watched it. And then I kind of thought, and I was like, but after, after... After all this, when you get into another relationship, what's going to happen? And I think one day, you know, they were saying, I'd love to just sit and speak with you about your Govinda. And part of me was thinking, perfect, great. I love speaking about Govinda. The other half of me was thinking, whoa, 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 slow your roll. Like you just got over here because of a bad breakup and who knows if you're even going to stay. And then I realized, I was like, that protective nature that I had in five seconds, in such a minute form, 
I understood why material nature is the way she is. If I wasn't ready to share my Govinda with my friend, who I know absolutely needed Govinda. If you're going through a hard time in life, of course you need Govinda. But I wasn't ready to share. Like, you know what? You're going to be gone in about two months. You'll find another life's purpose. And who knows? I'm not sharing my Govinda with you. I did eventually share Govinda. I did. But I could only imagine if this is how I feel. And I'm one small living entity. Material nature is going to be so much more fierce than me. So when we stand up and we say, that's it, I'm diving into my spiritual life. Material nature, I'm sure, is looking at us going, you just got over a breakup in the last life. Like you, you've been having this makeup breakup relationship with life for a long time. I've seen the way you treat him. I've seen how many times he welcomes you back with open arms and if we say, but you know what? I think I got this on my own. I think, I think I'm okay being in charge. Why don't you take a, you know, you just take a step back. I'll be in charge. No problem. So material nature is looking at this going in five seconds. You're going to decide that you're the boss again. And then my, my Govinda is going to be hurt. And that kind of changed things for me. Uh, one, thinking about how protective and fierce material nature is. As I say, Maya is so strong, she's going to test us. Why? Because we are trying to get in, 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 in really close with her Lord, with her person. But also, how many promises have we made, not just this life, Shrimi Bhagavatam says, every life we're making these same promises. From the time we're in the womb, making promises. Oh Lord, I promise, I'll serve you. I'll remember, I'll do all these things. I'll do everything. No problem, just get me out of this cramped situation. Help me. Only to forget. Only to be willfully ignorant. Only to push aside all of that and say, but I'm the boss now. And if we really understand the Supreme Person who says, there is nothing within you that does not find its origin in me. What does that even mean? Such, it's like really fancy Vedic terminology for all the feelings that we have. Krishna is going to have them times a million. So if we would feel hurt, if a friend promised us all these things and then flat left us. I can only imagine how hurt Krishna is when we do that to him. And then yet and still, if we just call the name one time, he's right back there immediately. This actually looks like a really unhealthy relationship except we're the most toxic people. We are the ones causing the unhealthiness in the relationship. So um, for me, journaling is a really good way for me to put things in perspective because I have to be able to look at my own actions. I have to be able to look at what I'm reading and then I have to be able to bring it down into, okay, what does this mean for me today? Um, and then when I look at what it means for me today, I like to draw those correlations to Krishna. How have I been treating my friend? This person that I say is my all, my everything. How have I actually been treating them? And would I, would I stay with anybody who treated me like that? Would I, would I accept that treatment from a friend, romantic partner, whatever the case is? If the answer is no, which a lot of times it is, when my answer is no, it gives me the impetus to change and to make lasting change. To round up and wrap up, uh, lastly, on the subject of shyness, which we keep going in and around it, um, but to, to wrap up that idea of shyness, Bhakti Tirta Maharaj, one of my favorite 
people in the entire creation. Uh, he never, never ever thought that anybody should be bound according to the limitations externally. Never. Uh, there were times when I don't even know how he knew that I played Murdanga. But we would be in Kirtan and there would be someone playing Murdanga, fired up, really, to my eyes, it looked like they were like, like really trying. Um, but to the spiritual eyes of the spiritual master, you know, I can only imagine that he must have seen something different. Because what he would do is in this big circle, in this big kirtan, all these people, he would take the murdanga from whoever it was, give it to me, and I'm always about like one and a half to two feet shorter than everybody else. He would give me this murdanga and say, go, go for it. Go play. And me, who was actually pretty shy growing up, I'm now like having a heart attack on the inside. What is, what's happening? Uh, but that's the, the effect of being near spiritual personalities. Their fierceness, right? Their overwhelming devotion. It pours out of them and, and, and into you. And he actually speaks about that, that it's like a phenomenon, you know, being in contact with spiritual people. It's like being near an electric current, right? You touch it, you also get electrocuted. But in being in contact with these spiritual people, you find yourself more empowered than you could have ever been. And so some of the first kirtans that I ever really led were because Bhakti Chitta Maharaj looked and said, no, you, you sing. And it's those moments that, you know, you want to rehearse for because it would always be something like, okay, sing the Shringa prayers, like no problem. And then you get up there and then the fear sets in and then you think, what are the words to the Nishringa prayers that I've been singing my entire life? <laughs> and you think there's, there's no board with the words anywhere? Okay. <laughs> but those are the times when we can set aside that shyness, everything in Krishna's service and be ferocious, be courageous, be brave. This is what Krishna demands. Uh, Krishna can look at that shyness and I'm sure he appreciates it. But I feel as though when push comes to shove, he starts demanding that we be brave. Confirmation. I feel as though he starts demanding that we be brave. He starts demanding, what, what exactly are you willing to do outside your comfort zone in order to serve me? And all of it's going to be outside our comfort zone. So we should kind of like get used to it. And our comfort zone is going to change. The minute we start thinking, okay, I'm comfortable with this, Krishna starts pulling in another service. Something else. I'm like, oh, well, I wasn't really comfortable with that. And that's how you know Krishna's saying, go, do it. And not only do we have Krishna rallying behind us, but we have all of our spiritual masters rallying behind us, saying, go, be brave, be courageous. Look at these examples. Stand up for, for this, this devotion without borders, without limitations. All of those things that you think you are, you're not, which works for the good and the bad, right? All the good things we think we are, Krishna is actually the ability in all of them. But all of the limitations, all of the bad things we might think we are, we're actually not. They have no effect on who we are truly. That soul within us can and will accomplish anything. And for souls who have taken up the service of Sri Krishna, we see that they are able to they're able to display all kinds of fun, mystical things, amazing qualities. Uh, there are innumerable spiritual, spiritual worlds. And on so many of those Vaikuntha planets, there are so many residents. And those residents take different forms according to service. 
So what's said is all the residents kind of all look the same. They're souls. But when you visit those, those spiritual planets, those Vaikunta planets, we hear that there are birds, bees, monkeys, trees, all kinds of things. And what they tell you is those aren't actually trees. Those are the inhabitants who have taken those forms in order to offer service to the Supreme Lord, in order to offer service to the people who serve the Supreme Lord. So if they can expand and change form at will, all for the sake of doing their service, then we should know that there are very, very, very special things in store for those who choose to serve Krishna. Those who decide to pick up this life of being a spiritual warrior, which Bhakti Chaitra Maharaj was so fond of using, and I love, like we, we're gonna keep carrying that term forward for those who decide to pick up this path of being spiritual warriors, it's not easy. It's going to be a trial. It's going to be a test. But there will be so many amazing mystical experiences along the way. So many amazing rewards. Uh, and I'll end with this. When we decide to do that, we think, we always hear, you know, when Krishna loves you, he takes away everything. But he, he also says that that is for the spiritually immature people. What does he do for the spiritually mature people? What does he do for all of our spiritual warriors? He does what he did for the, for the Pandavas. He crowns them the kings of the entire world. For Sudama, who was spiritually mature, what did Krishna give him? Everything. More opulence than this man could have ever imagined. And it is also said in that story, which I really, really, really love, says that Krishna gave him all that wealth on purpose. Our Vaishnavacharya, Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, comments that Sudama was a little bit proud of his renunciation. He was a little bit proud on how much he didn't need. He was a minimalist to the extreme. Right now we hear all these kind of like lifestyles and it's like minimalist lifestyle where you've got nothing. And I'm like, oh right, sannyas, uh-huh. <laughs> so he was really proud of how much he didn't need. He was so proud of his renunciation. And Krishna, being the great tester, he says, all those things you think you are, you think you renounced all this, I take it, I take it away. I don't want you to be proud of anything. Save and accept the love for me. Be fierce with that. But all of this renunciation, all of these things, that's, don't get stuck there. And so in order to curb that pride of the renunciation, Krishna as mercy, here in this situation does not take everything away. He gives everything. For a spiritually mature person, who do we have? We have Bali Maharaj. We have Prahlad Maharaj. We have Vibhishan. Those are demons. Three demons. But they were so spiritually mature that Krishna gives them everything. Bali Maharaj, he gives a kingdom more beautiful than even the heavenly planets. And with our service, like we said, if we can chart our, our way through the desert of the mind. Then we get to the oasis of the association of Krishna. So not only, right, Bali Maharaj really has to go through a dark night of the soul. Like he's getting everything taken away or so it seems. But he's so, he's going to stay so steadfast to his devotional service. That then Krishna gives him everything and says, I'll live with you. I'll stay with you as your doorkeeper and you can see me constantly. And if any of the demigods even look at you with greed or even think about coveting your position, I'll fight them personally. The same people he came to protect. He says, for you, my person, you've, you've given everything to me. 
No problem. I'll fight on your behalf. I'll stand as your doorkeeper and protector. I will be with you every step of the way. So when we find ourselves looking at those limitations, when we find ourselves even reading those, those difficult purports that rub us the wrong way, we can think about why. We can wonder, is this because I'm looking at this as a limitation that somebody is trying to put on me? And then we can remember what the lesson of surrender is. Okay, if I acknowledge that none of these limitations can, can have a hold on me when it comes to my devotional service, then I get the ultimate gift. Krishna will fight for you. Krishna will stand at the doorway to your heart as protector and will gain his constant association. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ashita Gosvi Mataji. Thank you for the lecture. So if anybody has any question, please you can simply use the emoji of raising your hand. I think we have uh, Sadi Prabhu first. Please omit yourself and ask your question. Hare Krishna, Mother Chita. That was well, you hit on so many buttons that I have, I have personally have such experiences. Like uh, you were talking about uh, leading the bhajans and when you think of yourself, oh, yeah, I'm doing so good. And then I've had that experience before. Mm -hmm. So it's really real and practical. Now, my question has to do with uh, what Shri said in the purport, mm. that because uh, shyness is such a big uh, weapon for women, it's, it's, a, it's an asset, actually. Uh, women who dress like half-naked would not have any respect, but unfortunately, or somehow that is what we see in today's world, that mostly women who can dress half naked are more respected, more popular in society mm. Mm. than people or ladies who dress decent. So my question is, is it because people of today have become so so downgraded that we cannot actually see what is real from what is false what is leading us or causing us to appreciate such mm -hmm. scenes like healthy naked women as opposed to women who are dressed fully covered Hare Krishna. yeah um it's it's interesting isn't it you know we we look at things in terms of today and back then and uh i often get into you know we'll have conversations and my mom will say you know kali yuga is progressing nicely because things today are so different from things back then you know so she says in the way she's like kali yuga is progressing nicely meaning this is terrible but so uh but then I look and I say, but mom, you know, if we look at, if we look at Vedic culture, if we look at things 5,000 years ago, not everybody was fully clothed all the time. Apsaras, who gained a lot of respect because they also had a lot of power, uh, Apsaras were quite free. They refused to be wives, mothers, and to be like held down. They, they, they actually, they shook off that whole situation and Arjuna got himself into trouble um, by giving the wrong kind of respect that the Apsara did not want. And so she says, you know, I, I'm looking at you as a very desirable man. You should enjoy with me. He says, but uh, I know that you had some sort of like relationship with like King Purava a long time ago. And he's kind of like my, like, maternal grand uncle father so I can only look at you as a mother and she says excuse me we are not mothers we're not wives we're free to love at will 
And you're like, yeah, but I can't really, I can't look at you any other way. And she says, fine. You want to, you want to act immature. She says, may your manhood fall away from you. And then everybody's upset. It's like, oh no, well, what are we going to do now? Oh my goodness. And then it turns out that it works out in his favor. You know, Krishna, he does what he does. You know, he's going to make it do what the, he's going to make it do all the things. So, you know, with Krishna in your corner, then all those things kind of get justified and they turn around. So, you know, is it just a today thing? No. You know, if we look at Nalakuvara and Mani Griva, they were sporting in a lake and everybody was naked. They were naked. The Apsaras were naked. Nobody had any clothes on. And then, you know, they, they saw Narada Muni. And the ladies covered up. Mostly. Like, you know, I'm like, how much can you cover up when you're in a lake, in the water, and then all the cloth gets see-through? Like, what? But they made the effort. Uh, Nalakuvara and Manigriva did not. And so when we look at this idea of nakedness or not or shyness or not or half clothed or not um not only is it a form of getting respect but it's also seen as a form of giving respect which i think is really interesting in, in terms of vedic society and hierarchy right so there were so many people uh who were following Vyasadev and shukadev goswami and they said that the, the ladies would cover up when they saw Vyasadeva, but not when they saw Shukadeva Goswami. Vyasadeva was a little confused. It's like, what's happening? Like, how are we different? You know, is it because I'm older? And they're like, no, you're looking, making the distinction between male and female forms. Shukadeva Goswami has no distinctions. That's a soul, that's a soul, that's a soul, no problem. Like, he's not even affected. Um, so when we look at it, we see that this place is a, is a place of making distinctions. They're going to put limitations. Uh, so sometimes we have to think about the kind of respect we want to give, the kind of respect we want to get, and the kind of attention that we want. Um, I think now everybody is very much on the, the mindset of, but I deserve to be able to be free. I've been constricted in every other area of my life, so I deserve to be able to be free. And the other people should actually just control themselves. This is true. I mean, it doesn't actually matter what a woman wears. She should always be respected. And, you know, what I, what I think is interesting is the word choice, right? Um, Srila Prabhupada doesn't say that they shouldn't be respected. It's that they won't garner respect, right? Like they won't get respect, but he doesn't say that they shouldn't be respected. They should, doesn't matter what she wears. They should be respected. But if we look millions of years, we can see that this is kind of not the case. We look at these demons, we look at all kinds of people we look at like and you know Srila Prabhupada is saying when you put fire next to butter the butter is going to melt and he's not just talking about human relationships right there's celestials there's all these these people and Ravana was thinking everybody's here for my enjoyment hey she looked amazing she knew what she was wearing no problem and Ravana gets cursed so this, this idea, it, it's not that they shouldn't be respected. They absolutely should. In, in all varieties and forms of life, in all walks of life, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what your occupation is. It, doesn't, it shouldn't matter. They should always be worthy of respect. The way this material world works, however, is that there are going to be people who are going to say, but this should all be meant for my enjoyment. Let me enjoy. Uh, and I think that 
that's the thing that gets everybody and and I think women and some men really angry it's that idea of well just because you're bigger or stronger and you think that you should be able to enjoy you're gonna like strong arm your way through and you take it um, this has always been happening not just women but you see there are demons who then they go and they decide we can pick on the Brahmins they don't fight for a living and then they do they torture them imprison them all kinds of things so this idea of the the strong trying to oppress the weak um, that's basically what we see in so many different forms and it's it's worth it to be aware of and yes there are different standards for everyone there are different standards of safety like a woman has to think about so many other things that I don't think ever even really cross the mind of some males depending upon where you live um, there I you know I visited South Africa and it, it was like kidnappings there were like a normal occurrence and while I was there one of my friends got kidnapped and then he was like texting us from the getaway car saying hey uh, I don't want you guys to worry but I'm being kidnapped what uh, and then he was saying oh and I have to stop texting now because the kidnappers want me to stop texting okay there are so many things wrong with this whole scenario but depending upon where you live there there are some things that that you know you think you're like oh it's just like being so in, in in such and such a place so you know there are different standards depending upon who you are depending upon what you look like depending upon where you live um there's always going to be double standards and that those double standards i think are the things that annoy people and and rub people so the wrong way that the pendulum swings the opposite way i won't be restricted or constricted at all i should be able to be free to the utmost but the actual thing is that this material world none of us are free to the utmost all of us are being restricted in some way shape or form it's only our you know our minds that create the illusion that i should be free i'm meant to be free and yes we are this is just not the place to do it so I think, you know, sometimes we do have to respect the uniform. You know, there, there's, a, there's a, a uniform, undeniably. When we go out, there's a uniform. And we are going to get certain reactions dependent upon that uniform. And as much as in an ideal world, those limitations wouldn't exist, we are not living in an ideal world. And it, it's, it's important that we recognize that. And we understand that the way we wear our uniform not only gets us respect, but it's a way of showing respect to others as well. Thank you very much, Matagi. Uh, so I think we take the next question. Uh, Shweta, Shweta, please, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Matagi. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Krishna Mataji, Dhanur Pranam. Uh, Mataji, I have a similar question uh, that was asked previously. Uh, Mataji, I hear a lot of senior devotees always telling me that the more you are covered, the more your head is covered, uh, your purity in bhakti increases. And Mataji, I get really confused because how is designation of clothing that is decided uh, for women especially, it is going to help me... Uh, increase my purity or it help yeah. me advance in Krishna consciousness if my bhajan kriya is weak. So I really yeah. find it really confusing when devotees do that. Do that. And uh, Mataji, if I can ask a uh, second question or should I ask later? Can I add Mataji? Yeah, add. Okay. Uh, Mataji, when I preach to young girls in college, uh, it, it's very difficult for me because uh, Generation Z, it's all about feminism and body positivity. So when I'm preaching about all this, 
uh, they they don't agree with it and they find Srila Prabhupada's statements very controversial, hmm. especially Mataji in Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 4, uh, Prabhupada <laughs> has mentioned, uh, mentioned rape. He yeah. has mentioned that women like uh, aggressive men who are very expert at rape and he has also mentioned that rape is not legally allowed. So Mataji, that is a very controversial statement and when I preach and when uh, young people ask me that question, I am very bewildered because I don't know how to answer that because I don't know what Prabhupada really meant and no senior devotee has ever clarified that for me. So Woo! Mataji, if you didn't clarify this, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, so the, the, the first part of the question, uh, which is sometimes we hear that the more covered up you are, the more advanced you will become. Uh, unfortunately, that equation does not hold. Um, there is, and you know, Srila Prabhupada came to give a taste of culture, right? So in giving them saris, in giving them all of these clothes, he was getting away from the short shorts and the tank tops with the no bras and the side boob, right? So like, if we think about what Srila Prabhupada was getting away from, he was just trying to get them to wear clothes all the way around. <laughs> it's like he was also trying to get them to take baths every day, sometimes three times a day. So we, we can't think that now, you know, and, and they, they said, oh, they asked Srila Prabhupada, oh, one time Srila Prabhupada, you know, the brahmacharis are getting disturbed by the ladies in the, in the lecture and then they, they're looking at them. Shouldn't the ladies go sit somewhere else? Srila Prabhupada said, if the brahmacharis are disturbed, they should go to the forest. They should go to the forest. Uh, sometimes you'll hear, you know, they, they, they're like, okay, but the more austere you are, the better. Don't wear any makeup. Don't, don't you dare wear an ankle bell. Don't do any of those things. Um, but really, if we look at the example, what do we have as an example? We have gopis who always had anklets. We have Sita Devi who was traveling through a forest, renounced with her husband, and she meets Anasuya who says, why are you looking so plain? It's like, but you're happy. You're a joyful woman. You're in love. You should never look plain here and gives her cosmetics and jewelry. And she gives her perfumes and makeups. And she says, you wear it always. She says, this is, this is an, an expression of your inner devotion. So if, you know, Sita Devi's makeup wearing can be an expression of her inner devotion. I, I heard about, there was a Pujari who used to serve Shishi Radha Govindaji in the 14, 15, 1600s. And he would always wear, he would wear like blue silk dhotis and golden armlets and, and jewelry, necklaces and earrings and all of these things. And he would perform his, his puja. And they, he would get questioned. Vaishnavs, Gaudiya Vaishnavs, others, they would ask him, you know, why? Why do you dress up so much? What's happening with you? And he said, you know, just if you had a prime minister to the king and that prime minister just looked homeless, would you give any respect to his position? He's got to dress the part and wear the uniform. So, so this is the uniform for me. My Lord is the, is the president. He's the ruler of all the 14 worlds. I must dress like I'm the prime minister representative of my Lord. And I thought to myself, that is a guy I can follow. I, you know, I'm a, I, we should dress up. They say Krishna dresses up. And every day is a festival in Vrindavan so that it gives everybody something to speak about. Did we see what Krishna looked like? He had these flowers in his hair. He had all these things. But does Krishna enjoy looking at, you know, people who look miserable? If you are in a genuine mood of renunciation and you just don't need it, right? You just have no concept of anything other than service, then fine. Krishna sees that. But if you are miserably renounced and you look like you've given up, then I don't think that that brings joy to Krishna's heart. We cannot bring joy to Krishna 
by making ourselves miserable. Nor can we bring joy to Krishna by making anybody else miserable. But really first, we have to start here. So if that's a thing that makes you miserable, then, you know, you have to, you have to adapt it and be able to do it your way. I feel like if Bhakti teaches us anything, if we look at Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's filled with personalities who are doing it their way. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no problem, you've got all this, this Bhakti Yoga, we're going to have a revolution, I'm going to do it my way. It's not going to look the same as everybody else's. But I'm going to do it my way, respectfully. In New York, you know, we, we see all kinds of things. But one of the things is that Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj would say this, Srila Prabhupada would say this, it's nice tilak and a doti does not a devotee make. Your devotion is not based on these outward external situations. And if we're simply basing it on that, we are missing the point. So we can't miss the point, you know? It, somebody could be chanting such sincere japa. But if we are fixated on, but where's your tilak? We're missing the point. This person is chanting sincerely. And if we've learned anything, Srila Prabhupada says, it just takes one moment, one mantra, one name for you to perfect your life. But all we can see is, but where's your tilak? Do you fit in? Are you conforming to everything? So sometimes it's not about conforming. Um, it's, it's about really embodying that devotion with sincerity. Now to the second point of your question. I'm so here for it. Uh, I, I think I feel like I've been waiting for somebody to ask me this question in a talking forum. Like people have asked me over an email, but I feel like I've been waiting for somebody to ask me this question. And people do, they say, you know, when we preach, we have that fourth canto one and everybody goes to the fourth canto, right? That, that fourth canto quote was like, how? Srila Prabhupada, what are you saying? My first question is, if we're just preaching to people, how'd they get to the fourth canto? Like, there's so many books before that fourth canto. It's just me. Like, you know, there's there's Bhagavad Gita. There's the whole first three cantos of Bhagavatam, which can take over a year or some change to get to if you read them, you know, in sequence. How'd they get to the fourth canto? So if you, you know, if you, if you find yourself as a preacher and you find yourself, you know, at that fourth canto, first of all, you know, maybe, maybe don't head to that part. But second of all, um, let's let's think about this, right? Uh, and I had a conversation with my sister about it, and I I really this kind of like changed my my viewpoint forever. Srila Prabhupada has written so many things, and everybody fixates on that one where it's like you know, uh, women enjoy a man who is expert at rape. I think is the quote, which just lets you know how long I've been waiting for somebody to ask me that question because I memorized the, the, the problematic quote. Um, so where do we put this? What do we do with this? What in the world could that even mean? Because then there are so many different places where it's condemned. The mistreatment of women is condemned all through Bhagavad Gita, right? So I think Srila Prabhupada actively understands the difference between this mistreatment of women in this most heinous, atrocious way. And, okay, so what's he saying now? Um, so in, in one, one way, I'll do the complicated version first, and then we're going to break it down real simple after. Uh, so the complicated way of looking at it is you have all of these primal urges. You look at animals in the animal kingdom, and they're constantly looking for the strongest mate. Um, I, I don't know why, but there, there was a, a documentary with like lions mating because the scientists were like, oh, well, the female was mating with all these males and it was weird to them. I don't know why, but they, so they decided to do a whole like small documentary on it. And when the female was kind of like testing all these, these lions, it looked pretty aggressive. But also she's kind of like looking out and trying to figure out who's the strongest amongst you. Because, uh, you know, survival of the species. 
when we get to a point where now, but we're, we're more conscious, right? Human beings are, are more conscious. Um, this, this idea of forcing one's self, like exerting this, this power and this force on another entity is condemned. Just look at Ravana, he was cursed. So it's not like the concept of, of rape is new. It's not new. It, it's been around since the beginning of time, somehow. Why? Because we are living entities who want to exert our power over others. So of course, this is not to be celebrated. And one would think nobody wants that, right? Like, what does he mean? somebody who's expert and the women want this so it, it, it you know when you talk about primal urges and the primitive the continuation of the species you get all these scientific terms and that gets difficult to understand and that's usually the response that happens right look at all the you know um he, he didn't mean rape like that all this stuff i have another idea this is a bengali gentleman coming from a place once again we started right they don't even show public displays of affection. They don't hold hands in the street. They don't kiss in the street. They don't hug in the street. Everything is behind closed doors. He's coming from this culture, now coming into a place where everything is free love. What I've observed uh, just while being in New York is sometimes when you get people and they're intoxicated, it almost looks like everybody needs saving. Um, I, I've seen people in relationships with each other, or at least it looks like they're in relationships with each other, and they're walking in the street, and they're both intoxicated, and one is more intoxicated than the other, and then the, the, the woman will look like she's like pushing the guy, doing whatever, and she's mad, and then the next moment they're kissing. And I was walking with a friend, and he, he has like a, an idea, he's like always trying to save people. And he was like, yo, look at this. He's like, you know, Every time I turn around, I, it looks like somebody needs to be saved. And I'm like, don't, don't save them because they look like they're okay. Like a the, the second ago, they were arguing, but now they're kissing. So it looks like they're fine. Don't go, don't go get in, involved in other people's business. They, it looks like they want this. I don't know. So that's one thing uh, that, you know, I can only imagine Srila Prabhupada was witnessing more than I witness now. Because everybody was super free. Uh, the other thing is this. How do you explain to a Bengali gentleman walking through the 60s, 70s in New York, where downtown, downtown Times Square is not what it is now? Disney has purchased Times Square and it looks really nice and beautiful. Back then, it looked completely different and it was filled with nothing but shops and peep shows and places where you could go and see any and everything any and everything uh then you know you 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 think okay fine but but how does that how does that justify this idea of force right because when we when we really examine this word it's like this this force forcing oneself upon another person how do how do we justify that and deal with that? Um, you know, what, what if this elderly gentleman is walking past all these shops and you see all kinds of things? Whips, chains, all kinds of things. What if this elderly gentleman turns to a disciple and says, what's that for? Now, in your mind, I want you to try and explain that to an elderly Bengali gentleman who's, who doesn't see people kiss. Like, what do you say? Well, Srila Prabhupada, some people in their romantic dealings with one another hit each other with objects yes with objects and they enjoy this yes Srila Prabhupada like how do you, how does that conversation go where you actually explain to him what's happening I mean like well who are the people that do this well the people who can afford to because it, it can be very pricey He's like, and people enjoy this. Like, he's like, okay, fine. Th those are the objects, but what? Why the the chains and the ropes? Well, Srila Prabhupada, 
they also sometimes will tie each other up. Willingly? Yes, willingly. Like how, how do you fix your mind? How do you fix your mouth to explain that to this man? And I guarantee you, I know he's seen so many things because it was so much worse. Everything was on display. So now you've got this whole movement of things and, and you think, yeah, but that's not like, okay, these are between two consenting people. Yes, but there's force and they need the force. The force is the thing that makes it exciting. So much so that how do you explain? Okay, well then she'll probably like they have to have a safe word. Like what? A safe word so that if somebody gets too overwhelmed then they, they they call time out and it's a safe word that can't be no because saying no is part of the excitement how do you explain that to this elderly gentleman in any other way that would make him come to a conclusion it's like then y'all must enjoy the force because I don't you'd have to be an expert in this forceful romantic dueling to know how to tie somebody up and all this stuff and all whatever and people pay big money for it now in fact one of the highest grossing franchises was like five years ago it was like 50 shades of gray where everybody now wanted to do it and the richer you were the more you wanted to be in with the in crowd so there are so, so many things that people have adopted in their way of life that if we think about trying to explain that to Srila Prabhupada, not only would he be confused, but we would be confused on how to explain it. But looking at that example, looking at how this whole, this movement of, of bondage and freedom in romantic dealings has kind of come to this place where not only is about like soft romantic dealings, but then they want this forceful romantic dealing. There are so many things that I am, I am so sure because one thing about Srila Prabhupada is he was so inquisitive. He would ask questions about everything. And so I can only imagine, you see all these things in shop windows, you see all kinds of things going on, like what is this? Did somebody explain this? And you can't. And, and, you know, it's like, why would somebody enjoy this? Well, human nature, Srila Prabhupada. People like different things. And so I can only imagine that in goes a purport where the Acharya is trying to take all of these elevated concepts and bring them down to a level where we can understand them. Because our minds have a hard time trying to deal with these elevated concepts. And now... He's like vilified for forever. Um, and, and I can only imagine it's coming from a place of trying to understand and trying to relate to this very, very backwards material creation. And the whole point of it is, is he's saying, you know, but there's going to be all of these things here. There are going to be people who actually value a person who's very expert in the use of force while being romantic that exertion of power over somebody else right they have names for them now and titles you have like dominance and you have submissives and you got all of these things you try to explain that dynamic to him and he's like okay well we're gonna we're gonna bring scripture into every lifestyle and now in bringing scripture into every lifestyle we're like well why'd you say that it was a horrible thing to say how could you just doing the job just trying to be an acharya <laughs> and um i think that you know if we if people are, are turned off by that one statement and they're unable to look at the 84 other volumes of work that Srila Prabhupada wrote how he gave his life to come and uplift everybody from all of these material limitations and designations it's a very unfortunate thing if we're unable to see that. But you know what? If I look at his body of work, if I look at his legacy, if I look at how he preached and who he preached to, he didn't hold women back. 
In fact, he protected his female disciples. He didn't hold back people of different colors. He emboldened them, encouraged them, pushed them to the forefront. He, he wasn't being sectarian. He would tell Christians, no problem, this will make you a better Christian. You chant whichever name of God you like. Jesus doesn't matter. He was trying to open up the spirituality for everyone. So I think it's important to, to remind people not to get lost on one sentence. And there are 84 volumes. 84 volumes of books written in less than 15 years. It's impossible. But he did it. Giving his entire life, he would say, these books are my soul. These books are my everything. So, yeah, uh, this world is a pretty backwards place. <laughs> so, I, I kind of I, I kind of agree with Srila Prabhupada. There are people who enjoy people who are expert at force. I may not have used the same words. But also, he was coming from a place where everybody's not so conscious and sensitive as they are now right everybody now is being called out and being called to be more conscious and called to be more sensitive about everything he did not come from that place that whole time frame was completely different around the world um but of course it is to be condemned when it when it induces trauma but how do you explain to him that that there are people who love the force and they pay for the force and they pay for all these things and then they they call it they they so many different labels they give to it you know it's like oh but it, you can come across so many things on the internet you know it's like people are like they it's like how to know if you've like made your girlfriend fall in love with her you and all this it's like but did you strangle her and i'm like really people are doing this to each other they're strangling one another why are we why are we doing this? But the people are yearning for this type of like interaction. Yearning for it. Both men and women. I've seen it. And then the people, they, because, you know, everybody likes to put so much information out on the internet. That so many women saying, but then, but then, but then he choked me just one time and that's how I knew. And we were soulmates for life. And I was like, wow. Okay not my thing but also how would i explain that to an acharya how would i explain that to this gentleman who renounced all the, the family life and all the you know he's such a a regal person how do i explain that and him not think i don't know but it sounds like like you know if you explain that to Srila Prabhupada, he's like sounds like rape to me i don't know so yeah, that's 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 my answer to the question. Um, one, how do we get to the fourth canto? Two, like you know, how do we jump, level jump to the fourth canto? Two, how are we looking at this one line instead of eighty-four volumes and a lifetime of preaching work? Three, how do you explain Fifty Shades of Grey to a Bengali gentleman? Thank you very much, Mataji. <laughs> for well, trying to explain the mind of Shilapar Pastor Rod. It's a very deep one. Thank you. And it's a struggle. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know. It's true. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a question before yes. we uh, ask a Bapcha uh, job to ask this one question. My question is that you during your lecture, you mentioned about uh, the, this... Uh, the chanting, our you know, the way we chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra Mantra sometimes looks like uh, passing uh, through the desert. Mm. And all these mm -hmm. our narrators coming out and uh, dense forest, you know. And sometimes we are unable to handle it. Me, I have a personal experience. And uh, sometimes I cannot even deal with my mind that uh, when I start chanting, I start thinking maybe... Uh, anytime I, I try to like kind of uh, observe, when I start chanting, you see this so much deal of this dust. I'm forced to go and do particular thing coming on in my mind. And when I don't chant, 
my mind is uh, a little bit calm and I started feeling, or is it because I'm chanting that this is this force is coming? Uh, maybe I should just don't chant or I should chant or then it will go away, you know. This there's this uh, this competition between my mind and why why I should chant or why I should not chant. And so before I will proceed, I will just try to recognize the presence of uh, his grace uh, Shiva's uh, uh Shiva's uh Vanachari Maharaj is on the on the platform. It's one of our senior, the senior most devotee here, yeah? and it's a guru also. Yeah. Recently, he gave a, a diksha to some yeah. disciples. So, so Maharaj, are you there, please? The idea you can just uh, say hi, <laughs> or if you want to say something. I just saw him, I said, let me recognize his presence. Are you there, Shivas? Uh, Thank you, Krishna. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Achuta Gopi Mataji, oh. wonderful class. Very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, and, and, and please forgive my strangeness. Um, <laughs> sometimes I feel like there's no other way to answer questions than to just be as out there and strange as possible, so please <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> You're welcome. I represent Bhaktichita Mara very nicely. Oh, thank you. So, Masaji, I don't know, maybe if we can try to, I know, find some answer to to pacify my mind because I'm in this tug of war, you know? Yeah, that's what the, that's what the mind is going to do, isn't it? Uh, the mind is going to find those ways to, to give a counter acting approach, you know? This chanting is wonderful for us. The mind says, no, it's not. In fact, it's ruining our lives. We should stop now. Um, and I find that the longer I chant, the more my mind, first, first it rebels, then it rebels stronger, then it rebels even stronger. And then finally, at some point, when it realizes it's not getting what, what it wants, like it's like fasting, you feel so hungry when you start fasting. And then it feels like your stomach is eating itself. And then you feel like, I'm going to die before this fast is over. And then when, you, when it starts to realize we are not getting what we are demanding, then it calms down. Uh, so I find that when my mind is most against me, I find that it's my cue that I need to chant more Japa. And the mind will tell you, actually, if you just chant less Japa, your life will be better. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Like, you missed your rounds. Okay, fine. Now what? The world didn't end. You're still fine. Why Why do we need to go through the whole thing and chant every day? But um, that's the trick. That's the trick. It gets us to become really comfortable. And the more comfortable we become, the mind wins. It says, oh, done my job. Uh, you know, it, Jiva Goswami says, and he breaks down the second canto of, of Srimad Bhagavatam. And he talks about Maya and material nature, and we hear this idea, Maya is very strong, right? Material nature. And then we blame her for everything. Maya made me do it, you know? Uh, more than like Mercury and retrograde and all the planets, we blame Maya for everything. But Jiva Goswami, uh, he makes a really interesting point. Maya does two functions. First, she creates this whole material creation. And then as the jivas awaken, he says, she only has to do one thing. She creates the link between us and the mind. She creates this link that says, you are that. You and your mind. And then she steps back and doesn't have to do anything else. So all the times we're blaming Maya for it, really? It's our mind. She's found a well-oiled machine, our minds, that will work against us will become our worst enemies if we don't make it into our best friend. And the way to make the mind into the best friend is not always to give the mind what it wants. Because the mind wants all these surface desires. But if we look deeper, we drop deeper down, closer to the heart where Krishna is, right? Going from here to here. The more that we drop deeper and say, okay, you don't want to eat anything right now. We don't need to do laundry right now. We don't need to think about the grocery list right now. What is it that's really happening? Sometimes, if we're, if we're thinking, oh, but I need to eat and I can't chant because I need to eat. Wait, what, what, what's actually happening? Why are we yearning to get up and, and go and do? It's like, well, I feel like I'm not accomplishing anything. Well, I feel like I feel, ah, 
then those feelings get us deeper into what what's actually going on and I've I've taken to journaling to my mind especially when my mind tells me you're never gonna make it you're never gonna make this happen you're doing nothing all this devotional service what are you doing what actually are you doing and I've taken to when I get the most anxious in Japa saying I'm not doing nothing I'm waiting on Krishna I'm not doing nothing I'm waiting on a miracle and it's the most important thing that I can do. I've had to tell myself again and again, almost every moment, every day, that this is the most important thing I can do. This is the one thing that's gonna make a difference. And, and like I said, every day, every moment, because the mind doesn't let up. It's not like, you know, I said that yesterday and my mind's like, no, we're good, it's fine. My mind needs constant, constant, constant reminders. You know, our, our, our Singha Guru Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasat Chakur said, you know, beat the mind in the morning with a, with a stick and at the end of the day with a shoe or vice versa. And yeah, you beat it twice a day. Mine, I, I need to do like an hourly beating. It, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work.